Um, okay, yeah. So I'm Lincoln. Um, so today I'm going to be telling you about work that was done by myself as well as Rohan uh, Van Houston and Ashley Maynard, both of the uh, Spiro Starmanis group at the Biohub. Um, okay, so uh, the uh, theme of this conference is uh, Beyond the Cell Atlas. So I thought it was appropriate to frame my talk through the uh, question of uh, what can we do, what can we learn from the cell atlas, right? <clears throat> and so imagine you've done a, a single cell RNA seq experiment. Um, you know, you've, uh, you've sequenced all of your cells, you have done dimensionality reduction and clustering, all this stuff, you've like identified your clusters. Um, it's like, okay, great, now what, right? Um, and so if you work in cancer like we do, um, maybe one of the questions you wanna ask is um, what mutations are in my cells, right? Uh, so cancer is a disease of mutations, right? Um, and so you might wanna ask, hey, uh, let me zoom in on the epithelial cells here um, and see what sort of like the full complement of mutations in these like cells of these samples are, right? Um, and so you might want to uh, construct a matrix that looks something like this, uh, where the, uh, the rows here are like the samples, but they could be cells, doesn't matter. Um, so they could be like, you know, the individual cells, and then sort of like the uh, full complement of like mutations that every single one of those cells has, right? Um, and so the important thing to keep in mind here is that uh, some of these mutations are clinically relevant, right? So we can, uh, we can target against them. We have drugs that are designed against, you know, some of these like EGFR and KRAS mutations, right? Uh, so sort of like gleaning this information is very valuable. Um, and so the rest of the talk, I'm gonna tell you about how we did this. Um, so, okay, so I guess the starting point is you're gonna do a sequencing experiment. It could be DNA or RNA, it doesn't matter. Um, that's gonna give you fast cues. Um, and then you're gonna do variant calling with a tool like GATK haplotype caller, right? Um, it's, it's great, it's an amazing tool, it's amazing that we can do this, right? But you're gonna um, end up with VCF files, right? Um, and if you don't know what a VCF file looks like, it's, well, it's something like this, right? So you've got like your chromosome, um, you've got a start position, you've got the reference base, so like what uh, base should be encoded at, at that position. Um, and then you've got the alt base, right? So like what base we actually found in your sample, right? Um, and then some quality information, like some meta information in these two columns over here. Um, and so this is great, like I said, it's amazing that we have this tool, um, but there are a couple pieces of uh, missing information. One is that um, it doesn't tell you what genes each of the v VCF entries is associated with. Um, and if you're like us and you work in single cell, um, you probably have something on the order of 10 to the eighth unique VCF entries, right? Um, so if you want to sort of like make sense of all of these uh, VCF entries and like make meaningful biological uh, conclusions, um, it's, it's sort of like, it's, uh, there are no existing tools to do that, right? Um, and so, uh, I'm gonna skip this. Um, and so we built one, um, uh, specifically to answer this question of like, uh, I guess ultimately like, what amino acid level SNPs and indels are present in my samples, right? Um, and the tool is called Cerebra. Uh, we've named it after an X-Men character. Um, so, yeah. Um, okay, so how do we do this? Uh, well, sort of the fundamental uh, intuition here is that uh, genomic coordinate information can be approximate or can, uh, be uh, uh, put into this data structure called an interval tree, um, which is sort of just like a binary search tree um, that you can, you know, use for genomic information. Specifically, you can give it like your, um, you know, your reference sequence, your FASTA, then your reference annotations, and like a transcriptome, right? You can build this like what we're calling a genome interval tree. Um, and then you can feed in every single one of your VCF files, which is what we've done down here, um, in sort of like a high throughput parallelized manner, right? Um, and then there are a couple of filtering steps that you can do if you want. Um, you can toggle those on and off. Um, and the output is gonna be a, um, a matrix that looks like this one right here, right? Um, and so how, how do we interpret this? Um, well, so uh, every row is gonna be a sample, right? So in our case, cells. Um, and every column is gonna be like a, a specific um, uh, um, snipper indel, right? And these values correspond to, so, so this is saying like, hey, like cell seven um, has five variant reads out of 10 total reads. Uh, for this specific uh, SNP, which is in this case uh, the 111th amino acid of TP53. Um, and it's saying, hey, I found an L, or I, I found a Q where there should be an L at that position, right? Um, and so, uh, from this matrix, we can actually like answer sort of the, these like meaningful biological questions like, um, hey, what mutations are present in my samples? Um, and we can obviously leverage the uh, additional resolution um, and fine-grained clarity of single cell in doing this, right? Um, Okay, so that's it. Um, I wanted to acknowledge um, a ton of people, uh, specifically my, inter uh, my uh, summer intern who worked with me, uh, Rohan Van Houston from Nueva High School. Um, he couldn't be here today, but he's brilliant. Um, in addition, you can find this on GitHub. Um, it's very, very close to being done. Um, we're hoping to release the software as well as a publication very soon, so.
Next, we have David Kelly from Calico to talk to us about deep convolutional neural nets. Uh, thanks so much for the opportunity to speak today. So for the last few years, I've been focused on um, building models to better understand non-coding DNA and how it relates to gene regulation. And the overall approach that I've taken is to bring in a sequence of DNA, perhaps a very long sequence, and to predict every regulatory annotation that I can get my hands on, everything from transcription factor binding to histone modifications, accessibility measurements, all the way to gene expression. And the primary tool I'm going to use to do this is a deep convolutional neural network. We've talked about these a little bit now, uh, especially for image analysis. These have been extremely useful tools. For biological sequence analysis, it's starting to become more popular. And for DNA here, the uh, convolution filters in the first layer really just represent position weight matrices like we've been using in bioinformatics for many years. The subsequent layers are then transforming the detection of those motifs into a more sophisticated grammar represented as vectors to represent sequence positions. Typically then I'm using layers that try to share information across the sequence so that we can start to reason about enhancer connections in these larger genomes, which is a big open problem in the field. And then ultimately making a prediction for all of the different data sets that I can get my hands on up to thousands of DNA chips and cage and things like that. So uh, you'll just have to believe me, because this is a five minute talk, this works reasonably well, that I can train on a set of sequences from the genome and then apply it to an unseen sequence and reproduce each of these data sets with varying accuracy depending on like mostly the quality of the data. So uh, recently this year took on my first challenge of working with single cell data. Single cell is extremely promising here because it gives an opportunity to zoom in one layer of resolution from the tissue level to individual cell types. And the first data set I picked up was this atlas from the University of Washington, which has been mentioned before. We drew an attack seek across many different tissues in the mouse and then ultimately clustering all of the cells to about 85 cell type specific profiles. So each of these single cells is very sparse, but once you've clustered them, you can kind of form an aggregate profile across the genome and uh, feed it into the convolutional nets as if it was a bulk profile. So one of the driving goals of this research is to work with non-coding variants in human genome to better understand their association with um, disease. And the convolutional nets and any sort of other machine learning model are neat in this regard in that once I've trained a model, I can put in any sequence. So even if I've trained the model on mouse data, if I believe that the cell types are pretty closely matched across species, which again, five minute talk, you'll just have to believe me that that's largely true, um, then I can impute what would be the mouse single cell ataxy signal onto the two different alleles from a human variant. And then I can compute a score that's basically a prediction of how much this variant would affect the accessibility in each of these 85 cell types. So to get a sense for whether that is at all a meaningful thing to be doing, I'm gonna tap into the Gene Tissue Expression Atlas data set. This is measuring RNA-seq across about 50 tissues in um, hopefully hundreds of individuals for most of these tissues. And then, of course, I have summary statistics from GTEx then that are influenced by the linkage to equilibrium structure of the human genome. So we've developed also some methods to take these sort of variant level annotations that are not affected by LD and sort of smear them with the LD matrix and compare them to uh, GWAS and especially EQTL sorts of GWAS. And when I do that then with these single cell mouse ataxy, profiles, which are along the uh, y-axis there. For each of the GTEx tissues, I'm pulling out the correct cell types with the strongest correlations between the predictions and the measurements of expression. So for example, for the liver, I'm getting very strong signal for the hepatocyte cell type clusters, for the lung, for alveolar macrophages, and other relevant endothelial cell types. So overall, 
felt like this um, worked pretty well. If you want to read more of the details and take longer than five minutes to do it, you can check out this paper on the BioArchive and some software to code up these models uh, that's called Basenji. And uh, just some closing remarks here. I thought this worked extremely well. I want to do a lot more of it. The single cell attack seek is uh, extremely good. I hope people continue doing those experiments and getting higher UMI counts so that we can better denoise and cluster. And uh, three prime single cell RNA seq is extremely promising since so many groups are doing it in different interesting settings. But it offers this challenge of being like really far away from the promoter. So it's something I'm thinking about a lot. Thank you, David. <laughs> Next on to Romain. So Romain Lopez from uh, UC Berkeley to talk to us all about single cell transcriptomics. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Romain. Uh, I'm a grad student at Berkeley, so I didn't have to travel a lot to come here today. Um, and I'm going to talk about... Uh, is this working? Oh. I'm going to talk about the, uh, how we apply these deep generative models to, uh, to single cell. Uh, and so um, I'm going to follow up a bit on uh, Fabian's talk today and, uh, and on uh, Aaron's uh, uh, talk yesterday. Uh, so Basically, this is joint work with uh, with Chenlin, who's right here, with Adam, who's watching us on the video, uh, Jeff, Mike, and and Ian and Aaron, uh, and also Zoe and some other uh, master student. Um, so, as we know here, nothing uh, really new. Um, uh, single cell RNA seq measures uh, gene expression at the cellular scale. There are a lot of exciting things we can do, and we we talked a little bit about side seq yesterday. Uh, the most interesting thing is that uh, with these all the biological questions we have uh, uh, when we see a tissue. Uh, we can transform them into uh, either cell level or gene cell level questions. So for example, if I look at the data set, how can I stratify it into cell types? So we can do this with an embedding, how we can we harmonize? We talked about this today already. Um, there are all these questions about normalization uh, or imputation. Imputation can be thought about how squaring the mean of a latent variable and how can we find genes that are different between cell types. And so Peter today was talking about the fact that it can be difficult to, uh, uh, you have to go back to these measurements uh, to do differential expression once you harmonize, but turns out here I'm going to talk about a method for which we can do everything in the same graphical model. Um, and so uh, this model has been published already a year ago, it's called uh, SCVI, and so the way we think about this data is that we have uh, some uh, latent variable and we have some observed variables, we can do some posterior inference, and basically we have this blue here, Z, which is a latent space that everybody is talking about, but we also have the row in red, uh, which we can use, um, which is the normal latent normalized expression, we can query this, and we can basically also do differential expression on the harmonized and normalized data. Um, this is very fast, uh, one hour for one million cells and 1K genes, and we use this uh, variational autoencoders. But basically, we don't have two neuro two neural nets, encoder, decoder, we have actually have six of them. Uh, and um, in the extension I'm going to talk about today, we even have like, we, we have more latent variables because we want to model site seek, and so we have like a 10, 10 neural nets or something like that. Uh, even they're not, they're pretty shallow, so we don't have this uh, problem of like uh, uh, not having enough data. So basically, uh, site seek, uh, we have the RNA counts, but we also have the protein counts, uh, and we want to do the same thing as in SCVI, so this is work by Adam. Uh, what we want to do is we want to learn this latent representation, we want to learn all these latent variables to be able to do uh, stratification, uh, harmonization, differential expression, and to do everything in the same graphical model again. So uh, what is the challenge? The challenge is that these uh, side seek measurements uh, they are noisy, and, noise, and the noise is pretty different. So we don't have this problem of sparsity, as in single cell. We have a background distribution, which comes from uh, non-specific binding and from ambient antibodies. And so there are quite some technical challenges here on how to model this data well and how to make a sense of it. So if you look at uh, CD4 distribution, for example, it's marginally trimodal. Why? Because you have uh, the background and one cell type and another cell type, which expresses which. Uh, expresses the protein at the different uh, concentration somehow. And so the, what we're going to do is that we're going to have a distribution for the background uh, and for each cell type. So we condition on this Z and we're going to have a mixture of negative binomials. We're going to learn the foreground and the background. And with this, we're going to be able to go back to all the original tasks and, uh, and to do differential expression and all these things. So one example for which um, this is actually useful is that um, now with this uh, mixture of negative binomial distribution, we can have a probability of being either in the background or the foreground. And if I show you, so uh, does this work? Ah, here. 
So uh, this is a CD16 protein, and this is the probability of being in the background of, for, of every cell for a CD16 protein. Each point is a cell, and if I look at O, all my average medium protein counts, uh, I, I have these two things. I can separate them by what is the low probability of background and high probability of background. I have two, you know, l two colors, and I, I'm asking, oh, so uh, this is just from the protein. If I did gating with facts, for example, I wouldn't be able to tell exactly what these cell types are. But uh, actually, if I l now we have this neural net that can tell you this axis here, and let's try to see what these are. And turns out, actually, the blue or more uh, NK cells and, uh, and CD16 monocytes, while the red or more CD14 plus monocytes and all these other cells. And the question is, how did the neural net figure that out? Well, the question is, I mean, the answer is because we have all this, we have a joint model. Uh, we can, uh, it can use information from different proteins and also different genes. Uh, and so very quickly, we can also do harmonization as I was talking about, uh, and Aaron talked about that yesterday. And the idea is that we have this code base. Uh, on this code base, we have a lot of software and pieces of model that uh, are available with tutorials. Uh, we have a code base that is modular and research-oriented and is very easy to plug in, put a new model, and uh, have a new research uh, paper or something like that. And so, uh, yeah, if you're excited, please come contribute to, to this uh, code base. Thank you. Thank you, Romain. <laughs> Next, on to Dan Burkhardt from Yale University talking to us about quantifying experimental perturbations. Uh, great. So my name's Dan. Uh, I'm a graduate student with Smith Krishnasamy at Yale. And today I'm going to talk about a toolkit that we've developed called MELD for compositional analysis of single cell data. So when you are looking at single cell data for multiple experiments, we often see something that looks like this. These are 30,000 cells from the zebrafish embryo shown in a fate plot. Half of them were injected with Cas9 and guide RNAs targeting a developmental patterning gene called Cordin. Those are the cells in red. The cells in, blues were, the cells in blue were injected with guide RNAs targeting a uh, pigmentation gene called tyrosinase. And what we see is that throughout this plot, there's a huge degree of overlap between the samples, right? So actually identifying like on different parts of this data set, like where exactly in this branch are, this, are the cell types that are the most enriched in one sample of the other is entirely unclear. And so to do this, you know, typically people will do some sort of clustering, as we heard Peter talk about this morning, um, but it's difficult to know, well, what's the right resolution of the clusters? And actually, we sort of realized clustering isn't even necessarily the right framework for this, right? Like, we have single cells. We should be able to estimate for each cell how affected that cell type is by a perturbation. And so we took a little bit of a step back and thought about, well, how is this data being generated? So we think of there as being some like high dimensional probability density function over the cellular state space. Here I'm just showing you two axes of cell state, but there's thousands. And then on the y-axis, we have some probability or data density that determines the frequency at which we'll observe various kinds of cells. When you apply a perturbation, this may be adding a drug, knocking out a gene, turning on a gene, the effect is that this underlying density function is affected, right? And so there are some kinds of cells that you're more likely to observe and some that are less. And really what we want to quantify is what are the regions of the cellular state space that we're more or less likely to observe as a result of the perturbation. Now you maybe realize that estimating density in high dimensions is incredibly complicated. And so what we do is actually just take a simplified data model, which is a cell similarity graph. I'm not actually going to tell you guys how this algorithm works. Uh, we have a paper on BioArchive I would encourage you to read. But the basic idea is we take like a KNN graph we use the sample labels that tell you this cell received a perturbation or did not receive a perturbation. We call this the raw experimental signal. And the output of MELD is something called the enhanced experimental signal that for each cell gives you a continuous label indicating sort of the conditional likelihood of observing that cell after you apply the perturbation. So why is this really useful? Let's go back to this data set. Uh, this was from Alan Klein and Sean Megason's lab, came out in science last year. Uh, we're looking at, uh, sorry, uh, 12 to 14 hour post-fertilization zebrafish embryos. You can see 27 different kinds of cells that they analyze, and here are the sample labels. They just did some, they just considered the full change, but when we use MELD, we can actually identify what are the regions of this data set that are the most strongly enriched in red after the perturbation or the most depleted in blue. So what's nice now is we actually have a distribution of values for each of the clusters that they looked at, right? So here I'm just going to show you one. This OP cluster are optic precursors. They go on to form the retina. Here, this gray dot is the fold change. This is just the fold change in abundance in the cordon condition relative to the tyrosinase control. And what we can see is that this cluster is depleted. And then we can see for each of these cells here in red or blue, indicating their sample, 
what the distribution of enhanced experimental signal scores are, basically how enriched it is. And here, there's actually a ton of agreeance, agreement between uh, the output from MELD and full change. But when we look at all of the clusters in this data set, we actually see a bunch of different kinds of stories, right? And what I want to focus on in the five minutes I have is this TPM, tailbud pre-Semitic mesoderm cluster. So the tailbud pre-Semitic mesoderm goes on to form the somites. What you can see is actually there's a huge range in uh, EES values here, right? Overall, this cluster is enriched, and actually the average EES score is positive. But this actually includes some cells that are the most depleted in the experimental condition. So, you know, using MELD, we were sort of encouraged to say, well, what's going on here, right? So if we just take those cells and we plot them using FATE, we can see actually this doesn't look like one cluster or population of cells. There's actually probably a couple of them, some of which are enriched, and others of them are depleted. And we actually go in and look a little bit more closely. We can do some clustering based off of this signal and identify, actually, that some of these cells, the ones that are depleted, correspond to the adaxial cells. Now, if you don't know anything about zebrafish developmental biology, adaxial cells sit within the pre-Semitic mesoderm, but unlike, they don't form somites. They form muscle. And actually, there are a bunch of experiments in the 90s showing that when you knock out cordon, adaxial cells get depleted, not enriched like the rest of the pre-Semitic mesoderm. So you know, I hope this sort of shows you how using MELD in this kind of analysis can highlight some of these differences in your data set. There's also advantages for things like looking, identifying gene signatures. Um, but with that, you know, come and talk to me later if you'd like to hear about this. I want to thank uh, Smitha Krishnaswamy, my advisor, and Jay Stanley, who's my co-first author on this, and encourage anyone who would like to learn more to either read our bio archive or go find uh, our code, which is all available on GitHub, or come talk to me later. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thanks for being on time. Uh, next to Nelson Johansson from UC Davis talking to us about the convolution in single cell. Thank you. So today I'm going to be talking about one of the projects in Dr. Kwan's lab that I've been working on. And it involves deconvolving bulk or mixed RNA measurements into cell type specific expression profiles and proportions. So deconvolution powered by these recent like single cell atlases that we've heard a lot about are an extremely useful tool for a lot of challenges. First, you can imagine that or in these like case control cohorts, you have a lot of bulk samples. But it's very expensive to generate single cell data for these individuals as well. So bulk or deconvolution can actually allow you to do single cell type analysis on the already measured bulk samples. Secondly, for multimodal assays like PatchSeq, they actually generate RNA measurements that are contaminated. That is, they have neuronal and non-neuronal cell material, which can obscure links between gene measurements and electrophysiology. And finally, for spatial transcriptomics, these techniques typically measure only like a subset of genes or spatial patches that are at single cell resolution. So decon deconvolution can resolve these spots, essentially these, these patches, into cell type specific proportions and measurements while imputing the remaining genome from the small set of measured genes. So our method is a deep and generative neural network with a hierarchical structure. Our model utilizes at its lower layers these single cell reference atlases to build individual generative models per cell type. And these generative models capture the signature of gene expression for each cell type. Then at the, lower, at the higher la layers of our model, we pass these like mixture samples, bulk or patch seq RNA measurements through each individual cell type generative model. We produce a cell type specific expression profile. And then we estimate these proportions, these weights, in a way that allows us to maximally reconstruct the original mixture sample that was passed through. So our model estimates both proportions and infers cell type specific gene expression profiles from mixture data. So we benchmarked our approach on two benchmarks, ROSMAP and CellBench. Both of these had known proportions of cell types in the uh, samples. And we found that our method, our method outperformed all their approaches. But most importantly for these like low abundant cell types like microglia, our method accurately estimated the proportions of that type in the mixture sample, while methods like CyberSort and NNLS extremely overestimate non-neuronal abundance. Or sorry, neuronal abundance. So while estimating proportions is very useful, 
we primarily designed our method as a way to take these RNA measurements and separate them out into cell type specific expression profiles. And I'm going to focus on that for the results. So the RousMap data set in its entirety measured 545 bulk samples from the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex of healthy and Alzheimer's patients. So we deconvolved these bulk samples first into proportions and found that for the majority of these samples, the excitatory cell type was a predominant proportion. And on this heat map, the rows are like bulk samples, columns, cell types, and red indicates increased proportion of that cell type in the bulk sample. And this is capitulated by the expression of markers in the bulk samples as well as a previous study. But more interestingly, we performed excitatory specific EQTL analysis and found a five or about a five-fold or three-fold increase in um, EQTLs per chromosome as compared to a data set where they actually measured the single cell sequencing for these cell types. We also checked the utility of our method for patch seq, which is contaminated by uh, non-neuronal and neuronal RNA. And we basically looked at Cadwell and Foldy, which are two recent or two studies of neurons. So quickly, patch seq is a method that allows you to generate RNA and electrophysiological response of neurons simultaneously. So by deconvolving these two studies, we found that about a third of the samples had high contamination for non-neuronal content, which can link, can like obscure links between expression and electrophysiology. So by removing this contamination, we found that we were able to better predict EFIS features from expression using our deconvolved profiles as compared to the contaminated patch seek profiles. So with that, I want to thank Visor and all of our collaborators at the Allen Institute and Sarah Mustafabi. Thank you.